Good morning. So uh, thanks to Aneta for a talk that lays out a lot of groundwork for some of what I'm going to talk about here. Um, demographically unavoidable fact of life is that what happens to individuals differ. Individuals have different fates as they go through life. And those differences matter uh, in lots of different ways. What I want to talk about is some methodological developments that I've been working on to enable us to look at the consequences of the variation in the fates of individuals as they go through their, their lifespan. And I'm going to start by looking at a particular kind of uh, fate for individuals, uh, lifetime reproduction. So this equation, which looks very similar to the Latka equation, but it's a little bit different, it takes age reproduction at age x, probability of surviving to age x, adds that up over all the ages. This gives you what demographers call the net reproductive rate. It's the mean, the average, lifetime production of offspring by an individual. And if that number is bigger than one, the population grows from one generation to the next. If it's less than one, it declines. This is used in conservation. It's used in epidemiology. It's used in um, ecology and demography. Um, but means are not enough. This picture is so um, familiar to population biologists that uh, nobody is even surprised to see it. This is the distribution of lifetime reproduction in a population of kittiwakes, a seabird, North Atlantic. Um, and although there's some average, there's a huge amount of variation. There's a few individuals that produce over their lifetime 20 to 30 surviving offspring, and a very large percentage that produce no offspring at all, and a big range in between, a positive skew, this long tail of individuals that do much better than anybody else. And you can, you can uh, find a zillion examples of this kind of lifetime reproduction. So there's two different reasons why that might happen. One is heterogeneity. There could be differences between those kittiwakes. The ones that produced 20 offspring could be better in some way than the ones that produced zero or one. And that's probably partly true. But the other part is what I call individual stochasticity. Differences among those individuals in the stochastic realization of what happens to them over the course of their life, even if they're identical. So I call this individual stochasticity. Um, the other group that's worked on this the most, Uli Steiner, who's now here as part of this institute, there he is, and uh, Sripad Tuljapurkar at Stanford, call this dynamic heterogeneity. Same thing, different names. So the thing that I want to show you about is a method to analyze this kind of variation that will work for any kind of an age or stage classified model. This is the kind of thing that Aneta alluded to at the end of her talk of looking at developmental stages or size classes instead of or in addition to age. Any kind of reproduction and much more um, and get information on the variation and the skewness of lifetime reproductive output. How's it work? The key to it is to describe the life cycle of the organism as a Markov chain, a kind of stochastic model. Interestingly, as I was putting this together, I realized that the two people who were most responsible for this approach to demography in the late 60s, early 1970s have connections here. One was Jan Holm, who was a director at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in Rostock, and the other a uh, gentleman named Gustav Feichtinger at the Vienna Technical University, who I understand is a fairly regular visitor to the Max Planck Institute. The idea is that there are stages that individuals move through, 
with transition probabilities, they die eventually. Once you die, you stay dead. This is called an absorbing Markov chain for that reason. You get absorbed. And there's a transition matrix that you construct out of this. You don't need to know any particular details about it, but it represents the probabilities of transition. Now I want to add a piece. I want to make this a Markov chain with rewards. So imagine an individual is moving among these stages. Every time you make a move, you collect a reward. Move from this stage, you collect a reward. Move to a different stage, you collect a reward. Stay in that stage, you collect a reward. The reward depends on what move you make. It's a random variable, and what we're interested in is the lifetime accumulated reward. Some individuals are going to die soon and not get very much. Some individuals will live for a long time and get a lot. And that will produce variation in these lifetime accumulations. What you need in order to calculate this is the transition matrix that has the demographic rates in it, and you need to know the moments, the mean, the variance, the skewness, and so on, of the rewards that you get for each move you make in your life cycle. And then you do a bunch of stuff. You can read about it. Um, and you get the moments, the mean, the variance, the skewness of the lifetime accumulated rewards. So let's look at reproduction. This is a nematode. This is Cynorebditis elegans, every molecular biologist's favorite nematode. And uh, the data I'm going to analyze came from a study uh, comparing two mutants that have about twice the longevity of N2, the basic off-the-shelf laboratory nematode. This is the distribution of lifetime reproduction in an experiment in the lab from these three strains. The N2 strain has a higher lifetime reproduction than the DAF2 strain, which has a higher lifetime reproduction than the CLOCK1 strain. But you can see there's a lot of variation, even though these organisms within each of these strains are genetically identical, and they're living in an environment that's as uniform as nematode biologists can make it. Still, we have individual stochasticity operating. So when I run that through the analysis, I get the following kind of results. Let me walk you through these graphs so you can see what's in here. This is the mean lifetime reproduction for the three genetic strains. So at birth, this strain has a mean lifetime reproduction of almost 300 baby nematodes. And as the individual ages, eventually that reproduction gets used up. Once you get out here, the remaining lifetime reproduction is zero, because they stop reproducing. And the other strains have lower means. Here's the variance. This is the variance in remaining lifetime reproduction just caused by individual stochasticity. And it also goes down. If I scale this variability relative to the mean by calculating the coefficient of variation, that's the ratio of the standard deviation divided by the mean, it starts off much less than one and then rises as you get to older individuals. And the skewness starts off negative. Skewness, right? If it's negatively skewed, it has a long tail to the left of low values. If it's positively skewed, it has a long tail to the right of high values. It goes from negative to very positive. That's a nematode. Suppose we look at a large mammal that produces one offspring at a time, more or less, lives for a long time, and we'll choose Swedes because there's all this mortality and fertility data for them. And when we do the calculation for Swedes, this is the pattern that we see. This is in 1900. These are the average lifetime reproduction, female offspring per female. One and a half actually increases for a while, 
declines once you get out here, remaining lifetime reproduction is zero. For different years, the value goes up and down. Lately, it's been below replacement, like lots of countries. That's the mean. What's the variance? Well, here's the variance, and there's considerable variation in the number of offspring. And when you plot the coefficient of variation, that is, standard deviation scaled relative to the mean, once again, it's small, on the order of one, until you get out here, and then it increases by a couple of orders of magnitude. When you're looking at individuals out here, the variation in their future reproduction is far bigger than the mean. The skewness becomes increasingly positive. And I've done this for lots of species with lots of different life histories, and you can get these kinds of measures of individual stochasticity. But it's not the only kind of reward we can look at. So one of the things that organisms do, and this relates to the resource allocation approach that Aneta mentioned, is to transfer resources to their offspring it, from one part of the life cycle to the other. Animals do it by parental care and feeding and, and the early bird catching the worm for its offspring. Humans do it, among other things, by economic transfers. So this is a project that I'm working on with Fanny Klugen in the Max Planck Institute in Rostock. This is some German transfer account data. This shows, as a function of age, the mean income for Germans, it's zero up until late teens, rises to a peak, declines to zero after retirement. This is the consumption. Children consume more than they, than they earn. In the middle of life, we earn more than we consume. Late in life, it switches, which produces a deficit. The difference between these, there's a deficit here, negative deficit here, and back to a positive deficit. What does the lifetime pattern look like? This is the mean lifetime income, consumption, and deficit as a function of aging for German population. So a newborn individual has an expected lifetime income of something over 10 times 10 to the fifth euros, and a lifetime consumption slightly less than that, so a slightly negative expected lifetime deficit, and it changes as you look at older individuals. What's the variance? This is the standard deviation of lifetime income, consumption, and deficit calculated looking just at individual stochasticity. So there is considerable variation in the amount of these quantities. Individuals will not all get the same lifetime income or the same lifetime consumption. Here's the coefficient of variation. For income, it starts off much less than one, increases dramatically. Consumption increases, but much less so. So there's huge amounts of variation in future income of individuals over 60 years of age, much more so than the variation in their consumption. If you were trying to design policies that are based on the future income and consumption of individuals, uh, you might want to take into account this kind of variation. This is the skewness, starts off negative, becomes positive. That's not the only kind of reward you can look at. Um, individuals, as they age, don't just age, but also age in different health statuses. So suppose we do a reward calculation where we define the reward this way. The reward you get for moving from one age to the next or from one stage to the next is zero if you are limited in your activities due to a health problem, and one if you're not limited. The lifetime accumulation of this reward is the number of years of healthy life that you get. Um, 
So I did a calculation on this using some health data. This limited in activities thing is question number PH030 in this survey, apparently. Um, this is the expectation of that reward. So here's females in Germany, life expectancy of just over 80 years, healthy life expectancy of about 55 years, and you can see as you look at older individuals, they have less remaining life expectancy and less remaining healthy life expectancy. What about the variance? What about the stochastic differences among individuals in what happens to them as they go through their life? This kind of healthy life expectancy calculation, there's a minor industry involved with cranking these numbers out. I have never seen these numbers calculated. If somebody, if they have been, I'd like to know about it, but I haven't seen it. This is the standard deviation in number of years of life and number of healthy years of life, healthy being defined by that question. There's considerable variation. It goes down with age. Here's the variation standardized relative to the mean. It starts out less than one. It increases late in life. The coefficient of variation of remaining healthy years is much bigger than the coefficient of variation of years of life in general. This is the skewness of life and healthy life. Starts off negative. Out here, it's positive again. A long tail of individuals with different degrees of with, with high values for this kind of longevity. So this is a, this is a kind of a uh, health status application of individual stochasticity that I'm really interested in exploring. It's not, this is the only, these are the only values that I've calculated, and I don't know if anybody else has calculated them. So you're the first to see them. Um, so to wrap up, um, You can do these kinds of calculations to get information on the variation among individuals. To population biologists, variation is, is key. Meyer and Dubshansky and other important evolutionary biologists have emphasized the fact that, that population thinking is essentially thinking about variation and the things that happen uh, on varying individuals. Um, this kind of stochasticity is pretty much unavoidable. And all of the examples I've looked at have lots of variation and some really interesting patterns. This increasingly positive skewness with age, when you look at age-classified populations, is uh, an interesting statistical pattern. And we're going to be looking at how general that is, looking at using different databases, among them some of the ones that Annette mentioned at the end of her talk. And so sort of trying to integrate this reward structure of populations into fully into the sort of biodemographic calculations. That's the plan. Um, I'm, I'm uh, indeed particularly happy at the prospect of being able to interact a lot with Max O, which is much easier to remember than Max Planck Odense Center for the Biodemography of Aging. Um, I think it's a wonderful development. I'm really glad to have had a chance to come here and talk. Thank you.